Welcome to the worship of God on this eighth Sunday after Pentecost. This is the eighth installment of our 10-week sermon series entitled Setting Sail with the Spirit. This series grew out of a reading and being inspired by Joan S. Gray's book entitled Sailboat Church, Helping Your Church to Rethink Its Mission and Practice. During the course of this series, we, we have considered many different things. We have looked at who we are as a church, and we've taken up the image or metaphor of the church as a sailboat by which to understand our call to mission. So we look at how we are moved and powered and directed by the presence of the Holy Spirit. We are, have explored who we are as a church, who the Spirit is, how we as disciples are called, enabled, and strengthened to serve, and how we are able to catch the Spirit together. We've also looked at the God-given spiritual coordinates for navigating, directing, and defining our mission in the world. We begin now with a brief order for confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we praise you for you delight and desire nothing more than to fill us with your Spirit. Open our hearts and minds to the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, that we may be moved and directed by the Spirit in all that we say, think, and do. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. The first lesson is from Ephesians, the third chapter. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you and be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who, by the power at work within us, 
is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second lesson is from Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the ninth and 10th chapters. Glory to you, O Lord. As they were going along the road, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. For as you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I'm sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts. Be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There's a little word in our language that can take a statement and turn it right on its head with its three letters. Can you think of what this little word might be? It's a word so powerful that a positive statement suddenly becomes a negative. This word is but, B-U-T. As in, I will follow you, Lord, but, and now the next statement that follows negates all that has come before. If I say I love you and then say but, what was a positive statement of I love you now takes on a whole different meaning because I have added this clause after those words. This word but is very powerful. And as we heard in our gospel reading today, it provided a way for those who wanted to follow Jesus to go back on their commitment and promise to him. I will follow you, Lord, But first, let me say farewell to those in my home. We are good as people at coming up with buts in life. We're good at making excuses and giving excuses. Excuses for this and excuses for that. Today, we are in our eighth week of our sermon series, Sailboat Church, helping your church rethink its mission and practices by Joan S. Gray. Some of the themes we have learned about are the difference between a rowboat church and a sailboat church. We've heard about Jesus, our captain, his cross as the mast of our ship, and how the Holy Spirit is the wind that moves the boat, 
the sailboat church. We've learned that we are the sailors on that ship called to pray, to study scripture, and to discern the call of the Holy Spirit in God's mission. And we've learned that as sailors, we are called to trust God and our Captain Jesus to lead and guide us. We can't just sit back and hope that things will be taken care of. We are the sailors, the workers, and the laborers serving in this mission, called to discern and to help move the ship according to God's will. We are called to be in relationship with the Holy Trinity, dependent on God and following God's lead, instead of working to make sure that our own desires and wants are needed and satisfied. In the sailboat church, the idea of have it your way doesn't apply. Instead, as sailors, we are dependent on the Spirit to help us to follow God's will, even though we don't know where the wind will ultimately take us. Last week, Pastor Gary spoke of the importance of putting down the oars of the rowboat and raising the sails of the boat through prayer. Prayer serves, as, serves to make life in the sailboat church a transforming experience for each individual sailor and for the community. And when the individuals gather together in worship, in the study of scripture and in prayer, we know that something transformational will happen because we have a God who has promised to encounter us and to come to us through word and sacrament, personally and communally. Prayer raises the sails as we open our hearts and our minds to hear the Spirit and God's call, to hear the sound of that wind. This week, we're going to look at what is needed to be moved by the wind once those sails are raised. As the Holy Spirit blows and fills the sails, what practices are needed to give the Spirit the freedom to fill the sails and move the ship in the direction it needs to go? As we've heard over the last few weeks, when churches begin to depend and trust in the Holy Spirit's strength, wisdom, resources, and mission in the world, then transformation and new mission in ways probably never even imagined before are revealed. However, as humans who are part of a broken humanity and who are sinful by nature, we are very good at making excuses. But this, but that, despite our best intentions, our personal wants and desires get in our own way. Our author, Joan S. Gray, says that God wants and calls us to be active partners in this adventure and in life and mission. She says Christians who want to sail with the Spirit will always be asking God what the repentant crowd in the third chapter of Luke asked John the Baptist. What then should we do? It is in answering this question that God enables the faithful to dream dreams and to see visions of what is being revealed and planned for the church. It is in this question that opens our hearts and our minds to see the new possibilities. So what then should we do? She also stated that sailboat churches through prayer and discernment may find that they are being called to give up what they want personally for the good of others and to further the mission to which they've been called. Pastor Gary spoke of this possibility for change last week. And today I will mention it again. Yes, we do like the things, things the way they've always been. Humans are creatures of habit and comfort. However, in the last four plus months, our habits have been broken and something new has been created for us, even though we didn't ask for it. People say they want to go back to normal and soon. 
I'm not sure, though, that what was normal at the beginning of March will ever be our normal again. Believe me when I say Pastor Gary and I both would prefer to be worshiping in the sanctuary with you, in the air conditioning, and not be wearing masks all the time. But maybe this is just one example of the Holy Spirit already moving us in a new direction. Our personal preferences only place barriers in the way of the movement of the Spirit. And Jesus showed us with his life that he came to serve others, not to live a life being served and having his own wants and desires met. He did not live and work according to his own comforts, but instead he lived and worked to be of service to others. What then should we do? If change is necessary, and if it is coming, then we will need to be willing to let go and try new things. We will need to be willing to let go of control. And believe me, that is hard for me even to think about. It means we may have moments where things do not go as we hoped they would go or as we had planned for them to go, and we might just fail. And no one wants or likes to fail. In fact, I avoided taking particular classes in college just because I knew it would be a risk and I might fail in taking those classes. But with the Holy Spirit guiding us and God leading us to not try new things and to take risks would be a failure in itself. Not trying would be like putting up barriers to block the winds of the Holy Spirit. God calls us to new things. God is recreation. And God is creating all things new. But God can do far more in our willingness to try than our, in our insistence to remain the same. This is when our buts, those B-U-T's, as we heard in the gospel lesson, try to stop the Holy Spirit from moving through us and in us. This is where our excuses become the power trying to move the church instead of the Spirit providing all that is needed. If we are going to be a people who live by the question, what then should we do? We also need to be open to the answers we receive, whatever they may be. In chapter 3 of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul tells the people, Now to him who by the power of word within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations. The wind is trying to fill the sails. It's up to us being open to the wind, filling the sails and leading us. As a sailboat church, we are called to be propelled by the wind and to make room for the Spirit to fill the sails as needed. Pastor Danielle Denise, the director of Evangelical Mission who serves in North Carolina, shared a posture of prayer at our 2019 Synod Assembly. She had learned this posture of prayer when she was in college. And as I was thinking about this chapter in our book and this topic, I was reminded of her words. She said, there are so many things in life and in the church that we cling to. Our wants, our desires, our feelings, our preferences, and then she encouraged those of us in the room to follow her motions. And I want to invite you to do the same. So think with me. And as I did with her on that day, think about something that you are clinging to on this day. Something that is really important to you about this church and the way this church has been or has done things. Maybe it's the style of worship. Maybe it's the time of worship. 
Maybe it's the music heard here. Maybe it's the pew that you sit in when we're in the sanctuary. Maybe it's how a particular ministry is done or led in this place. Maybe it's a particular person. Maybe even a leader of one of our committees that you feel needs to keep leading as they have been or that you think needs to lead in a different way. Maybe it's your excuse or your statement that includes a but when you are asked about this place and the ministries here. Now look at our posture as we think about these things and as we hold on to those things. When we're holding on to them and when we're clinging to them, we're now standing in a posture of defense, ready to fight, even when we really don't intend to. Now open your hands and imagine yourself dropping those preferences, those wants, desires, traditions, and feelings. But maybe now you're hovering over those things because even though you've dropped them for the moment, you might want to still remain close to them so that you can pick them right back up at a moment's notice. Now turn your hands over. See, the act of faith wasn't in letting go of that idea or feeling or preference or want. The act of faith is turning your hands upward, opening your hands to God, which in turn opens you to the Holy Trinity. It opens your heart and your mind and your hands to a posture in which you can receive. This is a posture where God will show up and give life. This is the posture where God's spirit can blow and move each of us. This is the posture of prayer that frees us to hear and to grow and to move forward where we are not held back by our preferences, our wants, desires, emotions, and personal ideas. But this is a posture of renewal, of recreation, this is a posture where we are open to whatever God is calling us and moving us personally and as a community to be. This is the posture of letting go and letting God and the Spirit move this sailboat forward in mission and in its call. We are called as disciples to live in response to the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I believe this sermon series is just one part of what God is calling us to do and to be. The Holy Spirit is moving here and through each of us. And so I ask the question, as the sails are raised, what then should we do? We can either hear the answer we are being given and be moved by it, or we can block the wind with our excuses and we can cling onto those things that we want. And we can use our buts and all the buts we can fit into our sentences. As Jesus said in our gospel lesson, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. St. Mark's disciples, friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, what then should we do? Amen. Let us confess in whom we know, love, and trust using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Confident of your care and help by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Merciful God, your reign is revealed to us in common things. A mustard shrub, a woman baking bread, a man mending a fishing net. Help your church witness to the surprising yet common ways you encounter us in daily life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. When your word is opened, it gives light and understanding. Increase our understanding and all of your creation. Guide the work of scientists and researchers. Treasuring the earth, may we live as grateful and healing caretakers of our home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As the birds of the air nest in branches of trees, gather the nations of the world into the welcoming shade of your merciful reign. Direct leaders of nations to build trust with each other and walk in the way of peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your Spirit helps us in our weakness and intercedes for the saints according to your will. Help us when we do not know how to pray. Give comfort to the grieving. Give comfort to the dying. Give comfort to those who are sick. Be a refuge to the weary. Bring justice to those who are oppressed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You show steadfast love and direct us to ask of you what we need. Help this congregation to discern and to ask boldly for what is most needed. Refresh us with new dreams of being your people in new ventures in this place and time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In you, our lives are never lost. Strengthen us by the inspiring witness of your people in all times and places. Embolden our witness now, and one day, gather us with all your saints in light. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love. We offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now we pray the prayer our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now receive the blessing. God the Creator, Jesus Christ the Redeemer, Holy Spirit, Comforter, bless you now and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Go in peace. Christ is in you. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.